What a great day to be in the Lord's house. Amen? Uh, no better place to be than in God's house. Now, we are having some people leave us, so uh, don't worry about that. Just because uh, they're leaving doesn't mean you can leave, okay? Uh, you have to uh, hang in with us until the end uh, of our time of worship. Um, I'm excited about uh, this new uh, step that we're taking in ministry. Uh, our Kids Connect uh, has been uh, running, oh, anywhere from 17 to about 22, 23, and, and uh, all the way from uh, kindergarten kids to sixth graders, and we've had a lot of problems in there, uh, and so we felt like we could get the older children out and have their own class, and, and so we're trying that uh, today. And uh, not only uh, are we having uh, uh, Isaac in there today, but uh, Pastor Cooper is going to be in there today uh, kicking this uh, off, and so that's a wonderful time. Uh, it's the first of the year, and here uh, at the first of the year, we're starting another series of messages. Uh, this series of messages is uh, going to focus on underdogs uh, of the faith, and we're going to be looking at one of those this morning. Now, you will immediately think, well, Jeremiah is not a, an underdog. He was an underdog. In fact, folks, we're going to be looking at some great men uh, in the Old Testament. And you're going to think, well, these are not underdogs. But, but you know, we only focus upon their victorious life. You know, uh, uh, we, we see the mountaintops. Uh, today we're going to be looking at Jeremiah and one of his experiences when God spoke to him. Next week, Pastor Cooper is going to be uh, uh, speaking about Abraham. We don't think of Abraham as being an underdog, you know, the father of the, of the uh, nation of Israel. But folks, uh, Abraham was not always a, a man of faith. Uh, and we're going to see that uh, uh, next week. Uh, the third Sunday of the month, Pastor Cooper is going to be speaking uh, about uh, the teen king, 17-year-old uh, 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 king who discovered the Word of God, and he's going to be dealing with, with how important the Word of God is in our life and, and how we need to study the Word of God and know the Word of God, get a grip on the Word of God, and that's a wonderful thing. I'm going to come back at the end of the uh, month in... Um, January, and we're going to be looking at Moses. And again, Moses is not considered a, a, an underdog, but folks, Moses was really an underdog. And, uh, and, and then uh, the first Sunday of February, uh, the last Sunday of January, the first Sunday of uh, February, uh, Pastor Cooper is going to be working with his doctoral uh, um, uh, stuff and, and, and so he has signed me the last Sunday of January, the first Sunday of February. The first Sunday of February, we're going to really see an underdog that about 98% of you have never heard of. How many of you have heard the name Mephibosheth? Okay, two or three of you. Um, we're going to be looking at Mephibosheth, and we'll probably start calling him Old Fib, you know, instead of Mephibosheth, because that's easier to say, to say Old Fib. But we're going to be looking at Old Fib and, and realize uh, he is an example of you and me and the promise that we have when we think about heaven and eternal life and the blessings that God uh, uh, wants to give to us and, and why Mephibosheth was blessed in the late years of his life, and we'll be looking at that. Then in uh, February, starting second Sunday of February, Pastor Cooper is going to do a series of messages concerning Christian marriage. And folks, if there's anything that needs to be looked at today in our society is Christian marriage. What is Christian marriages? How do you have a good Christian marriage? And He'll be looking at that. One of the sermons in that series of messages, I think, is going to be something about the empty nest syndrome. What do you do when the kids are away? And uh, he assigned that one to me, and uh, I don't know why. Uh, 
we celebrated our 50th uh, wedding anniversary yesterday here at the church, and it was a great time. And um, someone said, uh, uh, why are you celebrating 50, the 50th anniversary three days before your, your actual anniversary? Uh, uh, Tuesday night is our 50th uh, uh, anniversary. And they said, it may not work out, you know, why you're celebrating too early and it may still not work out. Well, my idea is if, if folks, it hasn't worked out right now, it's not going to work out in three more days. You know, uh, we, we're going to just celebrate the, the 50th. And so we're going to be looking at underdogs of the faith for a few weeks. And then we're going to be looking at marriages uh, probably February and March. And so I'm excited about what God has for us. In the meantime. I want us to look at Jeremiah, an experience that Jeremiah had at the potter's house. So take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18. We'll begin with verse 1 and read down through verse 17. It's a lengthy passage of Scripture, but I think we need to read the entire thing so we can get the, uh, uh, the, the concept and the, the, uh, the message that God has for us today. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. The word Lord there is God's name, Jeho uh, uh, Jehovah. It's one of the many names we find in the Old Testament for God. Uh, and, and so the Lord there, the word Lord there uh, is the word Jehovah. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from Jehovah. Go down at once to the potter's house. There I will reveal my words to you. So I went down to the potter's house and there he was working away at the wheel. That is, the potter is working away at the wheel. But the jar that he was making from the clay became flawed in the potter's hand. So he made it into an another, another jar as it seemed right for him to do. The word of the Lord came to me, house of Israel, can I not treat you as this potter treats his clay? This is the Lord's declaration. Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, house of Israel. At one moment I might announce concerning a nation of, uh, or a kingdom that I will uproot, tear down, and destroy it. However, if that nation I have made a, an announcement about turns from its evil, I will not bring the disaster on it that I had planned. At another time I announce that I will build and plant a nation or a kingdom. However... If it, does not, if it does what is evil in my sight, by not listening to my voice, I will not bring the good I had said I would do to it. So now say to the men of Judah and to the residents of Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to bring harm to you and make plans against you. Turn now each from your evil way and correct your ways and your deeds. But they will say, it's hopeless. <laughs> We will continue to follow our plans and each of us will continue to act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, verse 13, Ask among the nations who has heard things like these. Virgin Israel has done a most terrible thing. Does the snow of Lebanon ever leave to the highland crags? Or does cold water flowing from a distance evil fail? Yet my people have forgotten me. They burned incense to false idols that make them stumble in their ways. In the ancient roads to walk on new paths, not the highway. They have made their hand a horror, a personal object of scorn. Everyone who passes by it will be horrified and shake his head. I will scatter them before the enemy like the east wind. I will show them uh, my back and not my face or the day, uh, on the day of their calamity. Uh, may the Lord bless, his, uh, bless the reading of, of his word. Uh, how many of you remember an old, old gospel song that has the title, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, Thine Own Way? Uh, it's an old gospel song that is based upon this passage of Scripture. And it says, uh, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, uh, I am the clay. 
And, and it, it has become kind of an invitational hymn or a hymn of consecration, a hymn of commitment that churches would sing uh, at the close of a worship service. Uh, reminding us, beloved, that, that, that uh, we are nothing more than a lump of clay uh, in the hands of God and that God is the master potter and he is making and molding us into the kind of person that we need to be. And that's exactly what we find here in this 18th chapter of Jeremiah. As uh, Jeremiah was told to go down there to the potter's house and was told that he would speak to uh, God would speak to, to uh, Jeremiah at the potter's house. Now, now, how many of you ever seen a, a potter's wheel? You know what we're talking about? I've got a video here that, that kind of shows a, a, a potter's wheel. And, and what a potter's wheel is, is a, some kind of a service. Uh, uh, it's made out of fiberglass today, but, but in ancient days, it was made out of a stone that was ground down and through a series of uh, gears and, and uh, pulleys and, and belts connected to a, to a foot pedal, the uh, uh, potter would get that wheel turning. And on that potter's wheel was a, a lump of clay. And, and he would begin to mold that uh, clay into a, a vessel uh, that would uh, uh, eventually end up like something like this. Now this one here is, is uh, glazed and, and uh, baked and, and uh, really nice. This was done by uh, a, a woman who was a, a Jewish woman and, and became a Christian. Mary got this, I think, at a, a, a men's wives retreat. Uh, an another vessel would be something a little bit more simple and plain like this. But there are three things that are very vital, folks, for a vessel to be formed by a potter. The very first thing is that the potter had to have some kind of an idea of what it's going to look like. There was a purpose. He, before the potter would begin working with the clay, he knew what he wanted to make. He knew that his, his vessel was going to look something like this, or something like this, or maybe even a small little plate, or maybe even a great big huge jar that would hold five gallons of, of water or, or four uh, uh, gallons of, of grain. And, and so the potter had to have some kind of a purpose, some kind of an idea of what he was going to make. Now, second thing that we uh, uh, notice about a potter's um, uh, house is that the clay had to be pliable. Notice how that uh, potter formed that clay and, and that kind of clay kind of grew and, 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 and enlarged, okay? It had to be uh, the right consistency of clay and water because the clay had to be pliable. It had to be formed into the vessel that the potter had designed. Now, the third thing a potter's um, uh, had to, uh, to have is the amount of clay. Uh, folks, you could not make a, a, a jar that held five gallons of water if you only had that much of clay. Follow me? Uh, you, you, didn't, you would not want to have this great big lump of clay like this if you were going to make a saucer about this big round. And so the potter had to decide exactly how much clay they were going to have uh, to, to make the vessel that they wanted to make. And those are three very important facts about the potter wheel. You had to know what you're going to do. You're going to have to have clay that is all that can be made and, and formed into the vessel that you are making. And, and you had to have the exact amount of clay to make that vessel. You couldn't have more than what you need, nor could you have less than what you need. Now, with that in mind, go back to Jeremiah 18 and see what God said to Jeremiah. He said to Jeremiah, go down there to the potter's house and I will show you my work. And as Jeremiah went down to the potter's house, there are several things that he noticed. First of all, Jeremiah saw a potter who had a purpose. The potter was carefully working the clay with his fingers. But he also realized 
that God is a divine potter. God has a design in mind. God has a purpose in mind. In fact, folks, if you look at God's word, the word reminds us that even in the beginning, God had a design. He planned all things. We're going to be looking at the book of Colossians in our life groups over the next few weeks. And one of the things that I get excited about Paul's writing there in Colossians is the fact that, that Paul says that Christ is all you need. All things were made by him and all things were made for him and without him nothing was made. Folks, do you realize how great this universe is? But it didn't happen by chance. It, 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 just, it just didn't come into existence by chance. Uh, nothing times nothing plus nothing does not equal everything. I'm, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I understand that. That there has to be some kind of design. There has to be someone who is in charge. I was talking to my uh, brother-in-law several years ago, uh, I've moved him from being an atheist to being an agnostic. It's, it's taken us about 40 years to get there, but we're getting there. And, 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 and here a few months ago, we, we were having another conversation, and, and he was really not, you know, he, he, he has an IQ of about 178. Okay, and that's hard to, to uh, deal with when you have somebody who, who thinks that they're smarter than you are, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, I finally turned to my mom. I, I was up at uh, Bakersfield visiting my mom, and I finally turned to my mom, and I said, uh, look, see my watch? And, and she said, yeah, that's a nice watch. I said, yeah. I said, I was walking down the street one day, and, and a bunch of gold kind of came together and some silica sand came together and formed the crystal and gold formed the case and the watch and the, and, 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 and the wristband and, and some other little uh, black particles came together and formed the face and finally my, my brother-in-law said, oh, Ken, not again. Folks, if you look at a watch that I have today, Mary bought this for my uh, our anniversary a few years ago. But if you uh, uh, look at a watch, a watch has to be designed. Am I not correct? There has to be design. Somebody had to take the material that is used in this watch and form it into a watch. You see... Nothing times nothing plus nothing does not equal everything. You have to have design. And the Bible says in Colossians as well as in John's uh, gospel that, that, that God made all things. He's the master designer. He's the master potter. And this is what Jeremiah was experiencing when he went down there to the potter's house and he realized that as the potter was working with a purpose forming this thing, he also realized that God is the divine potter. God is at work. And beloved, what I would like for us to understand is that God is at work even today. He's working with nations today. He's working with individuals today. He's working with the family today. He's working with the church today. He still is at work. But we need to remember that God has every right not to bless those ones who are not working with him. Look at what he says there in the 18th chapter. The, verse 5, the word of the Lord came to me, house of Israel, can I not treat you as this potter treats his clay? Now what had happened? The potter was working with a lump of clay and the vessel that he was making became marred and the, ma uh, the potter started working again. And so it is today. You and I need to realize that, that there is a possibility that we per, uh, 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 prevert 
the, the, the work that God is doing by not working with him. Listen, we have, a, we have a misconception here. Uh, hang with me. Still love me. Uh, but there are individuals who believe, folks, that God has to bless America because America is a Christian nation. I've got news for individuals that believe that. America is not a Christian nation. Look at all that is going on in America today. Look at some of the things that our legislatures throughout our states have passed. Folks, if anything, many in America today are anti-God. They're anti-Christ. I, I, I'm becoming, I am becoming a large minority uh, in America today. Uh, if, if you are a straight man married to the same woman <laughs> for 50 years, you're stupid. You're, you're, you're ignorant. Uh, yesterday at our 50th uh, wedding anniversary celebration, Justin... Uh, shared a story, a true story that happened right here in, in, in Palmdale uh, a few months ago when, when uh, uh, Mary and I and, and Justin were there and, and, uh, and uh, we were eating and, and uh, something came up and, and was said to the, to the waitress that we had been married 49 years and the woman said, to the same woman? First, look at America today. America is not, we are on a slippery slope and we're falling away from God. We're sliding away from God. We're, we're moving in the opposite direction. And this idea that God has to bless America, and I like that song, God Bless America. Folks, we sing that song, it's a patriotic song, but there, God does not have to bless America. I do not find anything in this scripture that refers to the United States of America. I do not find anything here that says God has to bless that land called America. But let me tell you what God will do. He will bless lands who honor him. See, Israel was God's chosen people. Israel, folks, was God's chosen people, and the primary purpose was to show the world who God is. Uh, they, they were supposed to be the first evangelists. <laughs> they were supposed to tell the world about God and about God's love and about God's mercy, and what did they do? They rejected God. And they rebelled from God. And if you look in the Old Testament, you will find a roller coaster. They would be with God and then they were away from God. And they were with God and they were away from God. And they were with God and they were away from God. And here in Jeremiah, Jeremiah was told by God, here's what I want to tell you. This is what I want you to tell Israel. I do not have to bless you if you're evil and if you're disobeying me. And beloved, I want to share to you that the same thing is true with America today. God does not have to bless America. But God will bless America if America follows him. Same thing is true in your life and my life. Even as a Christian, folks, God does not have to bless me. We, we, we think, oh, I can do whatever I want to do and I can go and do my own thing, go my own way and say, oh, God, you have to bless me. God doesn't have to bless me, folks. The only thing God has to do with me when I disobey him is to spank me. We have two children, son and, and a daughter. The daughter's the first one, the son's the second one. And, and, and it never came up yesterday at our 50th celebration. 
Uh, but if you asked our kids yesterday if they ever got spanked, they would tell you, yes. <laughs> yes. I, I, spanking came more from me than from their mother. Um, I, yeah, I spanked them. Had, um, I, always, I always told the kids, uh, this is going to hurt you. Uh, uh, this is going to hurt you more than it hurts me, you know. Uh, or the other way around. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. Okay. My, my daughter, Christy, was a stubborn one. She's the bullheaded one. She takes after her mother. Oh. Uh, <laughs> she... Uh, told her to go to her room one time. I said, you're going to go, I'll be right in, and you're going to get spanking. So I went into the room, and she was still sassy. And I, she does get that from her mom. Uh, <laughs> and, and she was still sassy. And I, and I picked her up, and I, boom, you know, swatted her on the bottom. Oh! She had put a book. In her pants. <laughs> you ever spanked your kids? I, I know that's not the right thing to do today, you know. We spanked our kids. Uh, we disciplined our kids. We took things away from our kids. Uh, one time, Christy really misbehaved and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, she was driving one of my cars, and I took the keys away from her. And for a month, she had to walk to work. I, 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 I believe in discipline, folks. I really do. And the same thing is true with God. You and I cannot do the things that we want to do and disobey God thinking that he's going to say it's okay. Have you ever been spanked by God? Have you ever been corrected by God? Yeah. You've been chastised? We have this idea that, that God has to bless us because we're His child. But folks, God does not have to bless you. <laughs> if you're disobeying Him, He chastises you. Same thing is true when it comes to a family. Folks, we are to raise our family in the way of the Lord. Remember what Joshua said? Joshua said, as far as me and my household, what are we going to do? We're going to serve the Lord. And when a family does not serve God, when the family gets away from God, when the family ignores God, folks, God has every right not to bless you because you're not doing what he wants you to do. Now watch this. This is also true with the church. <laughs> we had this idea that, oh, God's going to have to bless us because we are His church. Only problem is we don't act like His church. But folks, do you, do you know that the church today... <sighs> the church today has moved away from being God's church. We, we've moved away from, from what it's all about. We get all upset when the preacher doesn't preach things our way. I have a good friend. He's my daughter-in-law's brother. Uh, pastor pastors at church down in 29 Palms. I, I'm not afraid to tell you where it's at. Palms Baptist Church in 29 Palms, California. He has a bunch of jarheads, a bunch of Marines down there. He took the church over a few years ago. They were running about 70. Uh, the last five weeks of uh, 2013, uh, they had three Sundays of the last five, over 500 people. Praise God. Bunch of Marines. He's being attacked.
by certain individuals in the church today. <clears throat> because he's told too many jokes and he's told too many stories. And it has taken, this is their statement, it has taken us away from the Word of God. So I told him, oh, what a terrible thing. Following Jesus, who was a storyteller. <laughs> I, uh, did Jesus not tell a lot of stories? Let me tell you what the kingdom of God is like, Jesus said. It's like a rich man who goes off into a foreign country, leaves his land behind. Stewards are to take care of it. They cheat him, <laughs> okay? He, he sends back other servants. They cheat the servants. Finally, they, they send back, the, the rich man sends back his son. They kill his son. Jesus was a storyteller. And Jesus also told jokes, folks. Oh, I know you're going to be theologically telling me that when Jesus was talking about a camel going through an eye of a needle that, that he was referring to a passageway in the mountains that the camels with all of their loads on their back couldn't get through. And my question to you was, who was he speaking to? He was speaking to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and fishermen right there by the Sea of the Galilee. And what were some of the fishermen doing? They were doing the same thing that they had to do every day. They were mending their nets. And how did they mend their nets? With a needle made out of a bone that they had drilled a hole through and they had the cords through that, e uh, that, that needle uh, and they were mending their nets. I suggest to you, beloved, that Jesus said, listen, Pharisees, Listen, religious leaders, it's harder for rich men to get in the kingdom of God than that camel over there to go through that eye of that needle. That's funny. And there are times that you can get your point across by telling a funny story. And so I told David Squires, I said, Brother David, don't get upset with these individuals who are, are upset at your preaching style. That's just the devil trying to get in there and disrupt the whole thing. Instead of praising God that they've had 500 people, you know, three times in five weeks, they're complaining about his preaching. Let me tell you something. Personal opinion, there's no better younger preacher in the state of California, Southern Baptist Convention, than David Squires. Excellent job. Excellent preacher. But you see, we get all these things going on in the church. Folks, do you realize that the divorce rate in the church is as high as it is outside of the church? We need to come back and remember that, that sin is sin. And God doesn't have to bless the church if we're sinning. Here, Jeremiah receives this word from the Lord and, 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 and God says to Jeremiah, uh, 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 I am the master potter, the divine potter. Israel's the clay. And I have every right to throw you away. I don't have to bless you in anything that you're doing that is contrary to what I want you to do. And my suggestion to you and me today is that's just as true today in our lives. God doesn't have to bless America, folks, if America is not walking with Him. God does not have to bless you and me if we're not walking with Him. God does not have to bless our families if we're doing evil in our life. And God doesn't have to bless the church if we're not serving Him and if He's not first in our lives. But there's something else here that is so important to remember. As God spoke to Jeremiah, he, he, he saw the potter taking the marred vessel and working it into something else. And you and I need to remember, folks, that God does not throw us on the junk pile. God is a God who gives us a second chance. God is a God who allows us 
to make some changes, to, to uh, seek his will, to seek his face, and, 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 he, and he molds us into something else. Uh, you remember what, what James says in chapter nine, uh, uh, 1, verse 9? Uh, he says, if we confess our sins, he, talking about God, is faithful to do what? To forgive us of our sins. And to what? Cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Folks, I don't know about you, but I am so glad that God is a God who gave me a second chance. And a third chance, and a fourth chance, and a fifth chance, and a sixth chance. Je- Jeremiah is simply reminding us, beloved, that, that as the divine potter with Israel, so is God to you and me today. He is the divine potter that wants to take our life and mold our life and form our life and and fashion our life into being a good vessel. Now we have different types of pottery here, different types of vessels, and they can be used for different things. But the important thing is that they're used for the purpose that they're designed for. And the same thing is true in your life and my life. God molds us and he fashions us into the kind of vessel he wants us to be. And we need to be willing to be used for that purpose. God has gifted every believer with at least one spiritual gift. And you need to find out what that spiritual gift is and use it for his glory and for his honor. But you may be here today and, and, and you may not know who Christ is and you may not know who God is. But God is saying to you and to me through his word that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us and to give us the right to be called a child of God. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus today, I challenge you to look at him. In just a moment, we're going to sing a a song of commitment. And if God is speaking to you and is saying to you, let me mold you, let me passion you. Let me, let me create a, a, a beautiful vessel in your life. I'm going to ask you to come forward and talk with me and I'll pray with you. Can, you can meet with some deacons back in the back and talk with them. But my challenge to you is to not go away from God's house today without placing your faith in Christ Jesus. Christian, My challenge to you and to me is this. Make a commitment today, this first Sunday of this new year, that you will allow God to mold you and make you into the vessel that he wants you to be for his glory and for his honor. Will you do that? I challenge you to do that today.